I do a, a good deal of work with uh, leaders in human resources. So this morning, uh, Dr. Sorensen talked about uh, you know the sort of role of HR and, and the HR function, and we, we heard kind of the distinction between OSHA and NIOSH this morning. And so I kind of work with folks that often work on the OSHA side. I couldn't agree more uh, uh, with, the, with the premise this morning that the, the vast majority of workers, their work life is experienced in small organizations. When you look at the statistics, it's actually Unbelievable. We did a colleague and I did a did a, uh, just a paper about work standards, and uh, you know if you graph like the size of the business and how what proportion of the work population you get, I mean you get to 80 percent of the workers in a size of organizations that's a thousand. I mean it's amazing how many workers' lives are in small businesses. Uh, so it's a, it's not an area that I have a lot of expertise in, but it's one that I really want to support uh, thinking about and. We really do need to think about how to make this stuff easier. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do one early part of the talk is kind of to bring you some ideas about how the human resource management world hears about and studies about this issue. There are some interesting overlaps, actually, now that I'm here, and we're kind of cross-pollinating. So. Um, there, is, there is quite a bit of literature in the human resource world about how to do uh, organizational policies and programs to make workers more productive. High performance work systems, they call it, and it's been studied for decades and decades. And there's all, there, out of that came some, uh, some studies of worker well-being. So in a lot of the literature, what you find in the world of HR is worker well-being is defined in terms of stress and burnout or in terms of the balance between the demands of work and the worker's capacity to execute on those demands. So yes, safety and health, you can see the bullets here. This is a very common definition, and I've got references later to this. Um, um, uh, Professor Guest is, is somebody who's written a lot, so, so I'll refer to him quite a bit. Um, so safety, healthy, and working environment is up there, but also the capacity to develop as a human being, growth and security, integration into a social culture and a social group, rights and reputation, uh, social relevance of what you're doing, consideration of the total life, um, adequate and fair compensation, and flexibility and choice. So what strikes me of this, and Dr. Sorensen talked about it, that, that both, both uh, Dr. Hasla, I guess it is, I hope I'm getting that close to right, um, talked about this idea that it's a, it's a multi multitude of things that really determine worker health and well-being. And if you go over to HR, you're going to see definitions like this. More, not better or worse, but I think they tend to think of it more in a totality of things about the work environment. Now, I realize, now having been at the poster sessions, that total worker health I think that's what they're calling it, right? So I'm looking at Lee, and he's nodding, just to, mostly to keep me confident. It's probably wrong, but he's going, oh, yeah, just keep nodding. Otherwise, he'll get it nervous. And so appreciate it. Thanks for the support, Lee. Uh, send me the corrections later. So, um, so th this total worker health thing is, in, in actuality, I didn't know this, very close to what a lot of people in the world of HR and IO psychology and, and, and that sort of thing are studying. So there's already, I think, uh, as always, room for them to learn from the folks in this room and maybe to, for the folks in this room to realize that there are people out there studying this in a similar way. But I don't know. It's quite possible that HR studies have used worker total health, but I don't think I ever saw that. And so, so there, there may actually be a place there for some new research. So this is kind of the way that HR and HR research look, if you sort of look at it from the perspective of worker health and well-being. So this, you can't read it, uh, um, but, but the, you'll get the slides. But basically, around the outside of this is my version of a very common idea, which some people call a talent life cycle. So if you could read it, you'd see that it starts with planning for the workforce, and then attracting and sourcing them, and selecting them, and deploying them, developing them, paying them, engaging, and then eventually separating them. And then back around it goes. And in the middle are the objectives that are very common in HR, engagement, leadership, diversity, performance, culture. And, and if, had I thought about it in time, I would have put worker well-being in there as well, in the sense that you just saw it. So this is kind of HR, 
Okay, so we'll just think of that circle as representing what's going on in HR. And that's pretty typical of large firms as well as small firms. If you talk to an HR leader in a small organization, they're basically a one, one person band that's doing all of that stuff. And no matter how big the workforce, they're usually thinking about that life cycle. So it's a question of whether HR should be or can be a catalyst or an impediment to this idea of worker well-being. Now, what has been studied a lot in HR is whether HR contributes to organizational performance. So that is a big, big deal in HR. What, is it worth it to have HR? Do these HR programs pay for themselves? What's the return on investment to things like training, recruiting, et cetera? Some of that work I made a humble contribution to in my earlier um, academic career at, at Cornell. So this is by far, and, and anybody who's writing about worker well-being in HR will start with a section that says, this is by far the, where HR is indexed, by far. Do we add value? Do we contribute to shareholder value? Do we make the organization better, et cetera? Now, um, so that, this is kind of the traditional idea. This is, again, you can't read it, but I'll just give you a sense of it. There is a whole realm of HR called high performance work systems. So giving people a realistic picture of their job, using valid tests to select the right people who will perform well, doing training, uh, giving regular performance appraisals and lots of rewards based on how you perform because that's been evidence-based shown to get people to perform better, profit-related bonuses, job descriptions that are really flexible so that we can move you wherever we need to move you and, and put you on the work that we need you to do, uh, multi-skilling so that you're ready to take on all kinds of work in this organization and be productive, improvement teams that are constantly looking at how to improve the work, problem-solving groups that are coming together to say, how can we be more productive and better? You get the idea, right? All with kind of a deal that says we'll avoid layoffs and try and keep you employed if we can. And now coming here, I hadn't thought about this in a while, but it's a really good question to say what is it like to work in a place like that? And I think it's pretty typical. Small business leaders want to do that. You know, you're at risk, you perform well, you get paid. You don't perform well, you don't get paid. We'll train you, but it's all in service of you being more productive. The more you can do, the better. Um, uh, who was it? I think I was talking to Kaylee uh, at her poster session about working at Yahoo. I hope I'm not taking this out of, out of turn, but everybody has said it. You know, Yahoo, Google, Microsoft in its time, et cetera. We have, we have bean bags you can sleep in. We have food all the time, et cetera. Well, you know, that could be seen as very generous and, and hip and that sort of thing. But if you, you know, and I do, you talk to a lot of workers and they say, you know, we're not fooled by this. We get it. This is so that we can be here our whole lives and produce all kinds of code and code 24 hours a day. We get that. That, right? So it's a really interesting question, a good place to put the two of, you know, your group together with HR on this. So another way to look at this then is, well, the good news is, the, the classic one, not the good news, the classic way would be HR is working to improve organization performance, and in doing that, HR is producing a set of practices that cause stress, burnout, lower worker well-being. So what these arrows say is a positive effect on organizational performance, but whether inadvertently or intentionally, uh, a negative effect on worker well-being. So what we'd like to have is maybe if we could contribute to worker well-being, then success would also be enhanced. Now again, this is from David Guest's work. I will say now, this is kind of a list of things that he talks about that might accomplish both worker well-being and and improve performance. I'm now struck by how much of this is actually in some of the total worker health work that we're seeing out of NIOSH, et cetera. So you can see much more, uh, much more emphasis here, particularly on the positive environment around bullying, about, around employment security, around health and safety principles, et cetera. So it's an, it's an alternative way, just to give you a sense, and again, I really recommend you, you know, look up David Guest and look at his work. A great deal of what I'm doing here is coming straight from review papers that he has done. So David proposes, and others propose, maybe the deal is that if we made workers better, uh, worker well-being went up, that would have a positive effect on organization performance. And I think in this room, um, the, the folks in here uh, are finding evidence that that's the case. And, and you see it also in the HR world. Turnover goes down, uh, injuries go down. You, a lot, there's a lot of looking at the workers' compensation costs, at the, at the total health care costs, and sort of moving that curve from going up at double-digit levels to leveling off. I, when I came before at Lee's invitation years ago to Colorado State, the, I, I talked about some of the research there. So there certainly is this ideal 
that if HR could contribute to worker well-being, then maybe we would also get higher work performance. And I, I would say in the HR world, there are really good intentions there, but I don't think that, I would say it's fair to say they don't know a lot about your work. So they don't have a lot of frameworks to figure out how this might be happening, particularly in small businesses uh, where the data is harder to get, where the connections may be more, uh, somewhat more, maybe more tenuous because the systems and the processes tend not to be as, as uniform or as well developed. So the, again, the, my bottom line here is there's some very interesting things I think you might find looking at the w work and well-being literature in HR, not so much because they know things you don't know, but it might give you some context and maybe others to contact who are doing work in this area already. I think the cross-pollination would be terrific. So in the end, if you look at David Guest's work, if you look at other people who do reviews, and, and again, this is where I sort of would say maybe you want to think about this. The, um, in the end, what you end up with when you read these reviews is pretty much people say, we really don't know. There is, if you do a meta-analysis, which yeah, yeah, I guess everybody in here probably knows what that is, but you know, sort of a summary of studies in a statistical way, you end up with very mixed findings. And, and so I think if you were to ask researchers in the world of human resource management, they would say, if you put HR over on the left and you ask, what is the effect on worker well-being and on organization performance, you we have pretty good evidence on organization performance, though even there, the question of how it happens, et cetera, is, is kind of left open. Um, but we also have uh, very little, I think very little evidence and a lot of mixed evidence about exactly how it affects worker well-being as, as HR people measure it. Sorry, I'm, those of you are, are wondering why I'm punching my phone, which is what I'm doing up here. It's not so that I can check earthquakes or the current temperature in LA or something like that. Uh, I'm actually just checking a couple of notes. I wanted to make sure I mentioned some good ideas that we saw yet. So, so, so I think there's, I'm sensing in this room that there's better evidence than the HR world knows about the effects and the mechanisms of the effects on especially worker health and well-being. And, and I think when I came before Lee, we talked about how promising there might be to bridge those gaps. I'll, you know, my bad, you know, I haven't done it yet. Uh, but I think, again, there's a, there's a set of references at the end of my papers to people in my world that do this work that, that it might be interesting for you to connect with. And some of them I even know. So maybe we could do it that way. So that's sort of part one. Part two, which I'm about to embark on, is to, to, to think about what we mean by a worker. I was struck this morning by the, um, the examples uh, that I think it was Dr. Sorensen gave uh, about the ecosystem, and I guess we saw a lot of them, the ecosystem of building contractors. The, the idea that workers who are doing construction tend not to so much be employed by one small business. They tend to basically be contract workers that move from business to business to business. And if you were going to make an effect on their health, does it make, I just love this idea, does it make some sense that we need to create an ecosystem of contractors? I noticed in the poster session, maybe an ecosystem of vocational training that is sort of supersedes their employment as, you know, in any given organization. So with due respect, uh, I'm going to say that my own, my own view is that virtually every element of our society, economics, regulation, public health, et cetera, are fixated on what will be a continuing model, but what is only one model of work, which is a person who works in a very defined boundary called an employee and has an employment contract. Now, I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I say this all the time to my HR colleagues. Some of my colleagues and I actually wrote a book about this called Lead the Work to say to leaders, your job is increasingly not just to lead the employees who are part of how you get your work done, but to be the kind of leader that is leading the contractors that also join you side by side with your employees, the kind of worker that is the that puts an organization together where volunteers and and freelancers and others are des are desire to work for you because they love your mission, because they love your sense of purpose, etc. So I thought what I would do is. Uh, and Lee was kind enough to say, you know, John, why don't you bring that into the room? And, and it's very nice of him uh, to, to say that. These are not so much worker well-being ideas, but it occurs to me that 
there is a, there's another way to think about work, and there may be answers to worker well-being that need to transcend employment. We already saw this morning, when people work as contractors, job by job by job, kind of a Hollywood model, the idea of where does their worker well-being come from, how do we get that? I, you know, we saw a bunch of examples. I expect a lot of like loggers and other people in very hazardous occupations probably work across an organization boundary, and employment doesn't really capture them. So I'm going to now give you some of my favorite examples from the book and that I've encountered. Uh, I have a, by the way, I have an absolutely wonderful job for me. As my baby sister will tell you, I'm not really all that smart and not really all that clever. And, but I get to do this job where people like you who do the hard work and the creative work have me in to speak, tell me about what they do, and then I write about it in a book or two, and, and you will have me come speak to you about it. Okay, so that's what this is. That's all this is. OK, so this, uh, how many people have made the transition from the iPhone 6 to the, uh, to the iPhone 7? Uh, anybody? OK. How many people were bothered by the fact that your headphones no longer plug in at the same time as you can p power? OK, so this is uh, my favorite photograph of that. And, and it happened to me, too. I hated it, right? OK. so. Then, so, so you know, we use our personal experience, and I have to write a blog every so often about work. And so uh, there's a guy named Kevin Kelly uh, in Silicon Valley. He's a reporter for Fast Company, and he put a book together called The Inevitable that one of my students gave me. It's a set of 12 things, principles in a way, about how technology evolves and changes our lives. And one of the principles is that everything is what he says, quote unquote, becoming, like the iPhone. What that means is every single day, your laptop computer, your iPhone, et cetera, your watch, every sing your automobile increasingly, increasingly, every appliance in your home, which is internet connected, completely sensor driven, et cetera, every one of those things is upgraded every day. Every single day, they upgrade. Most days, it doesn't affect you much. It works a little better. It's a little better protected. But there are those days where the shortcut key changes, or it looks different, and you've got to stop, and you've got to adjust your behavior. And then there's those horrible days, those of you that, that are old enough to have used a BlackBerry, or, the, or, or old enough to remember a landline, um, where you've got to change your entire behavior pattern. Well, I began to think that work is a lot like that. And I'm now, my, the editor said, why don't we call your column Agile Work? The idea being that work is perpetually obsolete and perpetually new. Every single day, artificial intelligence can do a little bit more of everybody's job. A little bit more. A lot of jobs, it doesn't affect very much. Some, it's tectonic. Every day, a contractor or a freelancer or a volunteer or a gamer can do a little bit of the work that someone is doing. And increasingly, those alternative methods are sometimes the best way to get work done. So let me give you some examples of those. And I'm hoping it might inspire some thinking, perhaps, not to be presumptuous that I'll tell you what to study, but just that it might inspire some thinking about these alternative work relationships and the, their implications for both the upside and the downside of um, uh, worker well-being, et cetera. So this is my first one. Here is the storyline. So uh, all of you know Disney, and I'm going to particularly, so uh, you know, Disney theme parks, Disney shows, et cetera. And, and then there's this other company called Siemens, which many of you may not know. And I apologize, these are all pretty much big company examples. Siemens makes things like elevators and monorails and stuff like that, a big uh, a technical R&D manufacturing company. They make medical instruments like MRIs and uh, hearing aids and stuff like that. So here's, here is my, here's my example. Siemens invents a hearing aid for kids. This is a real story. Now, Siemens needs somebody to market that hearing aid to children. So, so they go to their marketers. And I don't know, how many, has anybody worked for Siemens or know of Siemens? Anybody in the, OK, so you do a little. I'll, I'll put you. So if I go to Siemens marketers, who do they work for most? Like, who do they work with? Healthcare providers, right, engineers, people who are buying elevators, monorails, et cetera. So if you ask them to market something they built, they will tend to hand the person the spec sheet you know, and say, look, look at this hearing aid, look at the decibel differences, et cetera, right? And so, so you, know, you say, well, that's not quite, you can't really just hand the child the spec sheet. 
and say, look how cool this hearing aid is and expect, so that doesn't quite work. So you're Siemens and you say, well, let's stay within the employment box. Let's go out and let's recruit the best children's storytellers in the world. And we get them to come to our work fair and we make them an offer and they say, thank you very much. I've dreamed my whole life of telling stories to children and I'm, I'm not gonna take your offer because where are they gonna go work? It's on the slide. Right? Disney, that's who, and if Disney makes them an offer, they're there. So you have, and, and it's the same thing with artificial intelligence with Google. It's the same thing with commerce at Amazon. There are certain organizations that are gonna, gonna attract the best and the brightest in a certain area, and no matter how good you are as an organization, you're unlikely to get them. Now, small business, I know this is true, small business folks face this all the time. They don't have enough work even to keep employed a full-time advertiser, a full-time programmer, a full-time web developer, et cetera. So a great deal of the work of small business, increasingly, because it's getting easier, is done in these alternative ways. Now, in the Disney case, Siemens had a great idea. Siemens was building the monorails for Disney. And so uh, they already had a partnership. So Siemens, and I, Siemens found a guy, an IP lawyer, and I've interviewed him, Darren Sparks. Once a quarter, Darren goes to Burbank, California with a metaphorical briefcase. It's really a laptop, but basically, he goes to Burbank, California to Disney headquarters to open his briefcase and reveal to Disney the most, uh, the, the most secret things that Siemens is working on, things you get fired for revealing. Disney brings in a bunch of their Imagineers, that's what they call their engineers and their, their storytellers, and they reveal to him the most secret things about their plans for characters, et cetera. When you do that, this is what you get. So this picture shows, the, I like to think of the bottom left, the bottom right part as the Siemens part. So you can see the hearing aid for kids there. It's a blue package, a white package, very clean, very medical. You can see the spec sheet down there at the lower left. You know, so the bottom right is the, is the Siemens uh, kind of advertising approach, not too engaging. Not, I'm not saying anything bad about Siemens marketers, it's just not. And then, and then upper left, the Disney approach, right? There's a comic book there that I have a copy of because Darren was kind enough to give me. If you could see it, you'd see that in the middle of that is a rabbit surrounded by Disney characters. The rabbit in the book is shown by Disney characters that hearing differently is just being different and that there's this wonderful apparatus called a hearing aid by Siemens, by the way, that helps you hear better. And when you see it, I don't know if it's, I saw it and went, oh yeah, why didn't I think of that? And then I realized I know why I didn't think of that. That's why Disney isn't hiring me to tell stories to children because I don't think of this, right? So, so what I like about this is it did several things. And this is the, this is the framework we talk about in the book and I'll, I'll try and make it relevant to you. In the book, as we looked at these examples, what we, what we, what we realized was there were several things going on. The first one up there in the assignment is you have to deconstruct the work. So if you take the job of marketer, you can't see this. You don't go hire Disney marketers, and there's lots that the Siemens marketers still do. But inside there was one little thing called storytelling to kids. Inside there, now I think for you, this is a stretch, I think for you, you're going to find that if you deconstruct work, the hazardous parts are one part of a larger job, a larger ecosystem, or wherever is the leverage point on worker well-being. So deconstructing the work so that you can see the patterns, you cannot see the patterns of this until you're willing to take your job and break it apart. And then you'll see storytelling inside. Then you realize that storytelling is not an engineering thing, it's a fantasy thing, it's a creative thing. Second thing is the organization. What do we mean by an organization? Siemens had to break its idea of an organization and say, we're gonna dig a tunnel to Disney. Just this little protected tunnel in the, in, the, in, the, in the embodiment of Darren Sparks, protected by IP so that we keep our secrets, but we can't think of our boundary as being, as, of work as being our organization. If the best people in the world are at Disney, we gotta find a way to let our boundary reach over to Disney. And then rewards. Uh, I don't know this for a fact because Darren, when I asked him, told me the way we structured the rewards for the Disney employees, you know, bonuses, et cetera, uh, is secret. I can't tell you, John, because it's a proprietary trade secret. That's how important this is to Siemens. But I wager that Disney employees would do it voluntarily. I don't think it took a lot of money because as great as Disney is as a place to work, you never get to help kids hear better. 
And this was an opportunity for people at Disney to take on a project to help kids hear better. Another project they did is an MRI. Siemens makes MRIs. How do you make MRIs attractive to children and give doctors an incentive to use your MRI? So I'll give you a hint. Disney also has rights to Marvel Comics. So you tell me, what is the character that is the perfect way to make an MRI less scary? Marvel Comics. You've all seen, right? What character's in essentially a really cool MRI? Iron Man, right? So there, there we, so, and I don't know about, I, I don't know how many in the room have had an MRI. It's scary, it's claustrophobic. Um, I guess I'll, I, I cried every time I had an MRI. I was, I'm an awful patient. Doctors hated to see me coming. I read the comic book. I feel so much better now. I just, I think of myself as Iron Man. So I will say, I, I can attest that it really works. So you get the idea. Deconstructing the work, looking for the part inside that is the pivotal part, and then being willing to think creatively about your organization boundary, like contractors, like laborers who work across organizations. And then, again, it's a little bit of a stretch, but how do we think about the rewards that appeal to these kinds of populations? OK, a couple of other examples. This one is an example of um, uh, very common. If you need to get software coding done or develop a, a, an app for the iPhone or something like that, increasingly the best way to do that is not to employ app developers. That's not because employed app developers aren't any good. But the best in the world have tended to migrate now to platforms for developers, where you bring your work. You get on the web and you say what you need to get done. Go to Upwork or Aperio. This is TopCoder, which was bought by Aperio. And, uh, and, and you'll find thousands of people from all over the world ready to work on your project. Now, the worker health, again, I may be naive here, the worker health implications there, these are not people that are working in dangerous equipment or something like that, but they do tend to spend a lot of time on their screens, et cetera. So there may even be some health issues here. Now, one of the interesting issues, and it's, it's huge. I mean, you can web development, media development. Indeed, you can get freelance uh, chief, chief information officers, freelance CEOs. And again, a lot of small businesses, if you look at the proportion of the work they get done, especially when it's this kind of work, programming, media development, et cetera, a lot of it is done by contractors. And, and I think you see it. You see it in franchises, restaurants, et cetera. Now, one of the interesting questions, kind of well-being related, is can workers like this be engaged? So that one of the big knocks on freelance that I've heard from my colleagues is, well, they're not, they don't have an organization. They don't belong to anything. They don't have any engagement. There's no sense of team, et cetera. All, again, to stretch a little bit, all very important to worker well-being. Well, it turns out that when you look at the literature, there's a lot of studies out there that set out, particularly in the 80s and 90s, to show that not employing a worker is an exploitive way of getting work done. I mean, this was like, this is, the, you know, bang the desk, and we're going to prove it by going to companies that have contractors working next to regular workers, and we're going to measure their engagement. Well, it turns out, not, it's not a majority, but it's a significant uh, proportion of those studies found that the contractors were more engaged than the regular workers, that the freelancers were more satisfied than regular workers in a company. And when you look at what's underneath it, Again, this is a little hard to read, but it comes down to, do I have volition? So it's true. If you're forced to be a contractor when you want to be an employee, you're pretty unhappy. But if you choose it, you're happier. Do I get emotional support? So it is important to have a psychological relationship with the people you work with, with the company you work with. This is very tough for companies because if you let the contractors see the employee magazine, if you let them come to the employee picnic, et cetera, it forms great bonds. But pretty soon, some regulator will come in and say, you're, we've caught you. You're guilty of co-employment, and you have to bring them on as an employee. So this is a big dilemma in HR right now. And then continuity. Same thing, if I feel like I come back, if I come back from project to project to project, it turns out people like that are as or more satisfied than regular workers. Here's a good example of how computer programmers form a community when they're not employed by anybody. This has to do with TopCoder. TopCoder has a conference every year where computer programmers who are on the platform come to see the best computer programmers do work. So what happens is every competitor spins the wheel three times. They have to choose two of the designated APIs and then they get to build any app they want. 
on, and they have to deploy it to any cloud platform that they would like as well. The design problem that we're trying to solve is what is the top coder logo? What should it be? What should it look like? And so we're putting it out to the community. Extremely interesting to watch the evolution. Where are you going? I'm just going over to the scoreboard, check how the round's going. Behind me, we're currently watching the marathon match, which is a single problem that competitors work on for a period of 12 hours. So these guys have been sitting here for seven and a half hours now. Well, in between now and then, you'll probably see a few of them like this sleeping. <laughs> I, I've made a lot of friends from Top Color over, over the years. That, that's one of the reasons I love coming here, because I meet so many smart people. So I'm always reminded of Breakfast Club, meaning again, no pejorative, but you know that scene where they're talking about the physics club and and uh, he says, you know, it's social. We talk about properties of physics, and we enjoy physics together. And, uh, uh, and Judd Nelson says, see, it's social, demented and sad, but social, right? So I don't think this is that demented and sad. But it, it poses interesting questions, I think, for what do we mean by work? What do we mean by a community of workers? I noticed the, the emphasis on social media in one of the poster sessions. So is that, is that the way to get to, the, uh, to get to some of the education that we Need. Thank you, Lee. I'm, I'm, I realize I'm running a little bit of time. I thought I had a little more time. So I'm going to move ahead. I'm going to give you one more example of this, and then I'll, I'll finish up with a couple of other things. But I, I don't want to miss this one. This is my favorite example of getting work done where there is no organizational boundary, there is not one employee in this example, and nobody got paid. This has to do with, I guess, sort of a medical group, find, helping to find a cure for AIDS and how the cure fits into the AIDS virus physically. In other news for you this morning, there is a group of gamers. They have cracked a scientific puzzle that stamped, uh, stumped AIDS researchers for years, and they did it in just three weeks. Researchers at the University of Washington, uh, stuck in a roadblock, put the problem to video game players using a program called Fold It. The gamers quickly developed a protein structure that could help fight HIV and AIDS. And joining me now is Seth Cooper, creative director at the University of Washington Center for Game Science. Also here is Faraz Khatib, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Washington Biochemistry Department. It's good to have you both on with me this morning. Seth, I want to start with you because your department created this game, Fold It, which was used to solve this puzzle. So explain to all of us in layman's terms uh, how it works and were you surprised by the results? Yeah, I mean, so how Folded works is uh, we're able to take the biochemistry problems that the scientists are working on and post them as puzzles in an online game. And then we have an energy function that we got from the biochemists that can basically um, take a protein structure and tell, give you a number that tells you how well folded that protein is. And so all the players who are playing the game um, are rated and ranked based on how well folded their protein structures are using this um, energy function and scoring function. And then we can take the best, um, highest scoring results and give those back to the biochemists for analysis. Uh, Faris, you set up this experiment using gamers that had little knowledge, little experience in biochemistry. Why did you want to enlist them to try and solve these really complex scientific problems? Um, because in this particular case, every single uh, experimental method had, uh, had failed. For, for 12 years, um, crystallographers have been working on trying to solve uh, uh, the high resolution crystal structure of this particular protein and all those methods have failed. Um, the latest and greatest computational methods to try to do this using uh, supercomputers and all the computing power that we have in the world also failed and so it was really a, a, a last ditch effort uh, and, and a hope that, that the gamers would be able uh, to, to crack this. And so, uh, so you see what they did. Inside of this biochemistry problem, deconstructed, was a mathematical geometry problem about how to fold a virus to fit efficiently into a disease. Once the, the genius of that PhD, once you realize it's a geometric folding problem and you ask yourself, where are the best workers in the world to do it, you end up realizing, he did, there's a whole population of people that, fold, that do a folded game at night for fun. And so let's give it to them, and as you saw, a sort of crowdsource solution, again, that could never happen by employing. There is no employment model in the world that gets you this. They don't want to work for you. You don't have enough work for them. It's hubris to think you'd ever even find the 20 people that solved this problem out of the thousands that tried it. And the rewards, they got listed on the published paper. You can look up the published paper and they're listed, the teams are.
Okay, so that's part two, thinking about work beyond employment, thinking about the possibilities that both the domain of what you're studying as well as the, the solutions to what you're studying may lie in communities beyond the world of work. Now, I'm not gonna do these slides. I'm just gonna skip through quickly. Uh, and uh, just remind you, that the other thing I'm working on now, the new book that's coming out next year with Harvard will be about automation and work. And it's interesting how similar the principles are. You have to deconstruct the work to see the patterns. But what I'm also seeing, and I'll just quickly touch on this, the advances automation is making and being able to take on parts of work are really quite amazing. Some of you may know about them in areas of, of just to be stereotypical, surgery, et cetera, uh, prescriptions, uh, even patient care. Um, what I see in small business, number one, robotics are becoming very inexpensive, 20000 to buy a robot, We're very much less expensive than a worker. And what I hear from workers, one of the things, and this is controversial, I mean, and again, there's pluses and minuses, but let me give you the plus side. I hear workers say to me, I would never go back to a workplace that wasn't automated and that didn't have a robot. Far from, oh, it took my job, they say, I don't have to do the dangerous stuff anymore. I don't have to climb over that fence and brave dogs in the world because of the drone will do it. I don't have to walk a dangerous pipeline and be exposed to potentially hazardous chemicals because we have a sensor that can do that. Doctors, physicians tell me, I like robotic medicine because I don't get bombarded with x-rays by standing in the field where, the, where now the machine is doing the work. So just something to think about, about whether this new world of work deconstructed to see the pieces, and then reconfigured based on the best way for human workers to do it, whether there are employees or not. That's the lead the work part. And increasingly now, another option is whether automation ought to be doing that piece of work that a human either shouldn't be doing or that, that the robot can do better. I'll leave you with this. There are two, more than two. There's a continuum here, and we heard it in some of the presentations this morning. On the left-hand side, this may be horrible, all the risk is shifted to workers, no employers, no training, no careers. Everybody rushes to the lowest cost person in the world that they can get to do something and total exploitation of workers and their safety. That is absolutely possible. A lot of people have painted that scenario. But as you've seen in the examples, there is also a right-hand side. Your skills are perfectly transportable. These platforms let you find the work that suits you the best and get paid for it because the whole world can find you. Your career can be boundaryless, spanning lots of different employers, spanning lots of different tours of duty projects, et cetera. The matching of your skills to the work is better and we can consider the whole person because you're not limited to just doing the work inside of a job description. So you get the idea. I think there's a, there may be a parallel just again to over stereotype a bit probably, there may be a parallel here for thinking about worker health and well-being. Is the future of work, automation, alternative work arrangements uh, horrible for worker well-being, exploitive, or is it possibly an instrument for even better worker well-being? There are the references I told you about. I'm sure that Michelle and her magic will get those to you. By the way, thanks for getting the media perfectly to work. Thanks to everybody on that. And that's where you can find me. So Lee, thank you again for the opportunity. Thanks all of you for your attention. I'll look forward to questions and the panel. Yeah, any, anyone except my baby sister? Anybody? Uh... Well, she planted this question. So. Yes, exactly. Uh, sure, right. When, when so you were 10, um, Yvonne told me that you, yeah, go, go ahead. Great presentation. I wanted you to come back to the connection to small business. And so this is more of a personal opinion question about what role you think um, small businesses have or how to, to get over that strategic dilemma that we heard Dr. Um, Hassel present this morning uh, between horrible and wonderful work and the dilemma that small businesses face with options around low cost. So anytime they're going to be contracted out, they're going to be working with constrained budgets, et cetera. So whose responsibility do you think it is to help them overcome some of those barriers? Is it larger companies? Is it mm -hmm. government? Um, what do you think needs to happen to help both for yeah. prioritizing occupational safety and health, but also recruiting talent? You know, I think, so it's a really good question. Thank you. And I don't know that it's really been addressed yet. Um, a lot of the work that is currently being reconstructed like this 
uh, and again, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm an authority on this, but a lot of it doesn't, it isn't the kind of physical injury prone, hazardous chemical kind of work that I think a lot of people usually think of when they think of occupational self safety and health. That said, I expect that work is being roboticized, that work is becoming contract, and when it does, I think it gets unmoored from a lot of the protections that employment gives people. So. I do think that there, on the other hand, there is a transparency. One of my, I had a wonderful working group of like heads of HR from big companies, and one of the trends that they pointed to that needs attention is what they call democratization of work. And what that means is that a lot of the power here and a lot of the voice here has shifted to the workers. Social networks increasingly matter a lot more than hierarchies. Your relationship to a guild or a bunch of people that work like you has a lot more relationship to you than your relationship to any one company. Social media and digital media is massive in these groups and massive at the, in, in, in the world of work now. I don't know how many of you know of a place called Glassdoor, uh, but that's a place where you can go and you can see ratings by workers, many of them disgruntled, but still, of a company and, a, and companies Religiously, HR people watch their Glassdoor profile because recruits look at it. There's a place in Glassdoor about safety, about how we approach worker well-being, et cetera. And in fact, I was speculating with Kaylee that, uh, I hope I've got the name right, um, that based on her poster session, I would love to give Worker Total Health as a phone app to workers and let them constantly rate whether their employer is where it scores and, f and load those up to a website somewhere. So it kind of goes to, I think, there's a, there's, that's what I mean. There's a certain power that comes when work is unmoored from the employer, a certain democracy, a certain transparency. Thank you. Uh, I'm Knut Ringen, and I have a question for you about leadership. Uh, so about leadership. Thank you. And uh, the question is this. One of the big barriers that I think I've seen in many organizations is the inadequate preparation of frontline managers, in particular, to lead people. And uh, in small businesses, this can be uh, reflected in very many different ways. But one of them is for an owner who's an entrepreneur and starts an organization and has no training, no real experience in leading people, to instead of helping the people work smart, they drive people to work hard, because that's the culture that they know. Starting an organization is very hard work. It's bone breaking. And as a result of them being able to do that, they think everybody else should also be able to do that. So instead of being smart, they insist on hard. How do you overcome that? Yeah, so, so again, it's a terrific question, and, and I'm, I think there'll be terrific studies that come out of here, so I'm just spe I'll speculate a little bit. Um, I think one of the things, so just some impressions. One of the things I see in the entrepreneurs that, that I work with a little bit, I'm not, at USC there is an amazing entrepreneurship program in the business school and running across the campus. I have a tiny, tiny little connection to that when I see some of the students. So taking no credit, it's a really terrific program. And I think, I think most entrepreneurship programs are seeing a sense of purpose emerge in the students that are there. Whatever reason it is, uh, there, there is a desire to do good in the world very often as part of these entrepreneurship programs. So on the one hand, there may be an opportunity, and it may be a great opportunity, to embed or to start working with some of those entrepreneur programs to take that sense of purpose and translate it also into a sense of purpose regarding the workers and a, a sort of enlightenment about how to operate an organization that is, that, that is kind of dedicated to worker well-being. I think what you, in this room, you have enormous advantages because you know how to measure it and you know some of the research on that thing. I don't know that we see entrepreneurship programs yet reflecting that, even though a lot of you probably work at universities where you're within a walking distance of that program. I think the other one would be that there is increasing amounts of um, prompting given to frontline supervisors now with artificial intelligence. So there are already lots of HR systems that will prompt you when it's time, like they can predict who's likely to leave based on people's tenure with the organization, whether they've been married recently, whether they got a raise recently. All these things can be put in an algorithm, and you know that people might think about leaving before they do. 
Google is famous for developing this. Those things are getting translated into prompts for frontline supervisors. It's time to talk to your employee. Have you done this, et cetera? Seems to me there's also an opportunity there for those prompts to begin to be more aware of things like worker health, worker well-being, et cetera. So it's, it's not an easy question, but there's a couple of impressions I hope are helpful. Thank you. Thank you, John. You bet. Thanks. Okay.